Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Strange Pathways. I am your host, Scott Mort. I hope you've been having a fantastic week. If you get the chance, please, any platform that we're on, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, what have you, please go check out, if you haven't, episode one, if you already have, episode two of The Cult of SMMI. I didn't want to put it in the Strange Pathways podcast. I kind of wanted it to have its own separate platform. I, I think it's incredibly important, number one. Number two, there's really not of a lot of a paranormal bend to it. So it's it's a different kind of terror. Um, but it is it is oddly frightening. It's more of a true life horror than anyone can even really imagine so please go check that out leave comments and if you yourself or someone you know has either been a member or had dealings with smmi please reach out to me strange pathways mail at gmail.com much appreciated i did want to read an email that i i received here a little while ago, I finally got permission to to uh, to read this email. This is from the user goes by the name Glory Hound. Uh, he writes to us and says, "So my dad told me the story. When he was a teenager, he was hunting with my uncle, and they decided to split up. Maybe ten or twenty minutes later, he took down a deer and was gutting it. He kept hearing this howling getting closer, and what he saw." was a cat-like creature mixed with a bear, and he said it was staring him down. It let him leave with the rest of the deer, and it took the guts. He passed away in 2016, I decided to do some research, and the same thing keeps coming up. It's called the Ozark Howler, and to this day, I believe his story. And I believe he's lucky to have left alive. Gloryhound, thank you so, so much for for that email very fascinating story and it just goes to show that it it is something that happens nearly every day for every for every person that reports this that tells somebody about this there's hundreds of people i'm convinced hundreds of people that this happens to and they say nothing or they just leave it amongst a few friends this this is an occurrence that's much, much more common than we think. I also got a comment recently on on one of my uh, one of my previous videos from a long, long time ago. About two weeks ago, Brian of Phobos8862 uh, commented on my video, and this is from eight years ago of what was the Hook Island Sea Monster. The comment reads as follows. I once met Robert Lesserec. By the way, that is the person who took the photos of the Hook Island Sea Monster. In Australia around 1979, we were sailing up the east coast of Queensland. He and his family had a house up a river where they were building another boat. We docked there for a few days and spent time with them ashore. They told us the story of the monster and they showed us the original photos. They all seemed very credible. They told us that they had filmed the creature underwater, but they did not have the film with them. They said it had been sent to the University of Sydney for analyses. Whatever happened to that film, if it turns up, it could settle the matter. Well, listeners and Brian, I have sent a few emails out to the University of Sydney. I have gotten in contact with someone and is anything happening? Is stuff not happening? I, I, I don't know. They did message me back for more information. I sent them what I had and now I check, I check my email 
Whereas it was only once every two or three days, I checked my email several times a day, waiting to hear back. As soon as I know, you'll know. On to this week's tales. On that fateful day of May 27th, 2020, 41-year-old adventurer Nathan Campbell embarked on a journey that would lead him into the heart of the Alaskan wilderness. Chartering a plane out of Talkeetna, he set his sights on Kerry Lake, nestled in the remote northwest corner of Denali National Park. Armed with basic camping gear, an abundance of food stored in plastic containers, and a two-way satellite communicator to stay connected with his family, Campbell had an unconventional mission ahead of him, to spend the next four months alone in the vast and challenging landscape of interior Alaska. The chosen destination of Kerry Lake presented a formidable challenge. Surrounded by miles of uninhabited wilderness, the terrain was rough with head-high alder thickets and waist-deep beaver ponds obstructing travel in any direction. To reach the closest town, Lake Minchumina, a week-long journey through the harsh wilderness was required. It was solitude at its most extreme, and Campbell seemed to have found the perfect setting for his unique quest. However, Campbell's solitary sojourn was not a mere escape into the wilderness for personal enjoyment. As he confided in his pilot, Jason Sturgis, during the flight to Kerry Lake, Campbell was on a mission to uncover something hidden in the depths of interior Alaska, the Black Pyramid. This mysterious underground structure, shrouded in conspiracy theories, was rumored to surpass the famous Cheops in Egypt in both size and and age. Its existence was said to have been wiped from satellite imagery due to its alleged importance to national security. The choice of the Black Pyramid as Campbell's objective was intriguing. It aligned with other conspiracy-inducing military installations in Alaska, such as the notorious High-Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, also known as HARP, near Fairbanks. The supposed location of the pyramid also held historical significance. General Billy Mitchell in the 1930s recognized the geostrategic importance of the area around Lake Minchamuna. Situated equidistant to major urban industrial centers of the Northern Hemisphere. The Black Pyramid gained further traction in the 1990s when scientists studying shockwaves from a Chinese underground nuclear test recorded a mysterious pyramid-shaped interference 700 feet below the surface of interior Alaska. The age, origin, and function of this pyramid remained unknown, adding an air of mystery to the conspiracy. Campbell's quest was not solely driven by internet lore, but also by a tip from an anonymous retired naval captain revealed on the program Coast to Coast AM. The captain, who had worked on top-secret radar installations in Alaska during the 1980s, claimed that a massive underground pyramid near Lake Minchamina disrupted aircraft and communications with its powerful electromagnetic field. This revelation led to threats of court-martial when the captain reported it to his superiors. As Campbell delved into the heart of Alaska, the narrative of secret bases, government cover-ups, global warfare, ancient aliens, and pyramid power converged in the story of the Black Pyramid. Now... Whether Campbell fully believed in this narrative or used it as a pretext for solitary exploration remained uncertain. The National Park Service only became aware of Campbell's disappearance when he missed his scheduled pickup in mid-September. A subsequent search yielded some of Campbell's equipment, including cracked food bins, moldy clothes, and a battered tent. However, Campbell himself was nowhere to be found. 
The last entry in his diary, dated late June, cryptically mentioned going to fetch water before vanishing without a trace. Despite extensive efforts, the NPS had to abandon the search as winter approached, bringing icy winds and sub-zero temperatures to the region. On October 1st, 2020, Nathan Campbell was officially declared missing. The quest for the Black Pyramid, shrouded in conspiracy and mystery, continued in the remote expanses of the Alaskan wilderness, where the elements and the unknown awaited those daring enough to seek the truth. In the chilling grip of the Alaskan winter, Cary Lake and its surroundings are swallowed by an icy veil, deepening the enigma surrounding Nathan Campbell's disappearance. With each passing day, the biting winds carry whispers of untold secrets, and the pristine, snow-laden expanses conceal any trace of his presence. The eerie silence of the remote region seems to cradle a mysterious tale, inviting speculation that transcends the ordinary bounds of logic. Beneath the shadows of the dense boreal forest and amidst the vast, snow-covered landscape, an ominous theory persists like a spectral presence. What if Campbell has stumbled upon the Black Pyramid? Lost within its ancient and cryptic chambers, he may have become entwined in a reality beyond comprehension. The whispers of conspiracy and the purported powers of the pyramid echo in the solitude of the Alaskan wilderness, prompting unsettling questions about the fate of Mr. Campbell. As search efforts cease, and the Alaskan winter tightens its grip, the expansive realm of interior Alaska stands as a silent witness to unfolding mysteries. The Black Pyramid, if it does indeed exist, remains veiled in shadows, and Nathan Campbell's story becomes a haunting enigma etched into the frozen wilderness. It awaits the thaw of spring for its secrets to be unveiled, or... Perhaps, like a whisper carried away by the Alaskan winds, lost forever in the icy embrace of the unknown. On the tranquil morning of August 16, 1977, Mitchell County, which is situated near Pelham, Georgia, became the stage for a remarkable and mystifying event. In this rural enclave, just 20 miles north of Thomasville, the retired 63-year-old automobile salesman Tom Dawson embarked on his usual routine of assessing the fishing prospects at his favorite pond. The clock marked 10.30 a.m. when Dawson, accompanied by his two faithful dogs, tugs at my heartstrings. I, I love dogs. I love dogs. Faithful dogs, too. Gorgeous. Dawson and his two faithful dogs approached the fenced enclosure surrounding the pond. Little did he anticipate that this routine excursion would unfold into an extraordinary encounter with the unknown. Suddenly, a circular spaceship materialized, navigating adeptly between the trees and hovering mere feet above the ground. Simultaneously, an unseen force seized control, rendering Dawson, his dogs, and even the nearby cattle immobile. Dawson has become a witness to an otherworldly spectacle. He described the spacecraft as approximately 15 feet in height and 50 feet in diameter. Its exterior boasted numerous portholes and a dome crowned its structure. Uncharacteristically quiet, the ship displayed a kaleidoscope of rapidly changing colors. A surreal scene unfolded as a ramp descended, revealing the emergence of seven hairless, snow-white beings standing at an approximate height of five feet. Their distinctive features included pointed ears and noses. Some of these extraterrestrial entities sported a tight-fitting one-piece suit, 
while others appeared unclothed. Communication transpired through high-pitched, incomprehensible gibberish. The following events took an even stranger turn, as the entities conducted what Dawson interpreted as a medical examination. A skullcap-like device found its place on Dawson's head, accompanied by a large hula-hoop-shaped apparatus fastened around his midsection, tethered to a mysterious box. While the examination was in process, Dawson heard a loud voice shout, I am Jimmy Hoffa! I am Jimmy Hoffa! I am Jimmy Hoffa! The voice almost said the phrase again for a fourth time, but it was cut off, and the voice was not heard again. Following this inexplicable examination, the beings gathered what Dawson could only describe as some leaves and stuff, swiftly re-entered their spacecraft, and disappeared from sight in the blink of an eye. Released from the unseen force, Dawson, now grappling with the physical and mental aftermath of the encounter, made a hurried ascent uphill, covering around 300 yards to reach the sanctuary of his trailer. The unsettling experience left him struggling to breathe and communicate, necessitating his immediate transfer to Mitchell County Hospital. Upon examination, the attending doctor diagnosed Dawson with both mental and physical distress, resulting from his close encounter with the UFO and its entities. Treatment for hysteria, including calming measures, was administered, and Dawson was eventually discharged. In contemplation of this perplexing experience, Dawson shared a chilling belief that had he been a younger man, the entities might have taken him away. The incident stands as an enigmatic chapter in the rich tapestry of reported UFO encounters, leaving a lingering sense of mystery and fascination in its wake. I read a lot of stories about alien abductions, but this one, this one really caught my attention. This was reported to the National UFO Reporting Center in 2007. Now, the witness did not give their name at all, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to kind of tweak it. I'm not going to write it as a story. I'm not going to read it from notes. I want to read the report to you. Because every time I've rewritten this, every time I, I, I've recorded this from notes, something gets lost. So I feel it's, it's important for the report to get out there. And it goes as follows. This is a recounting of an abduction experience I've had about six years ago. Nobody knows about it, or the other countless abductions I've had for as long back as I can remember. The first time I remember there being quiet, bright lights in the sky above the backyard, I, I felt this strong urge to go outside and check it out. And when I did, they took me. And they've been taking me ever since. Sometimes they'd come for me, other times they called me, and I would have no choice but to let them. I did tell my parents about it once, as a little kid around six years old, when the greys left me in my living room instead of dropping me back in my bedroom. They blamed it on sci-fi movies and video games, and I got yelled at for making up stories. That was the only time I tried to tell anyone. When I moved from home into my apartment, I slept with a 9mm under my pillow for months, but I was always paralyzed when they would come for me, 
so that idea was a bust. Setting up video cameras in my bedroom proved ineffective as well. In the morning, the tapes would be blank like I never set them to record at all. And after a while, the fear disappeared from the abductions, and I started to accept that getting pulled out of my room on random nights was just something I'd have to deal with. One night in July of 2001, I was abducted, and it seemed business as usual. I was called to the room of my apartment, and then the flash filled my eyes, and when it cleared, I was laying on the table again. The greys usually planted dozens of acupuncture-type needles in my chest, stomach, neck. Rarely would they insert a tube into my ear or throat, which was quite painful. This time was the tube in my throat. As the machine was being prepared, several of the greys seemed to rush in from another room. I felt a rumble in the table I was laying on and heard a loud explosion, followed by what seemed to be weapons fire. Several minutes passed, and then a tall, armored figure wearing a blank face mask entered the room, carrying a type of weapon resembling an assault rifle. The figure removed the mask to reveal a very canine-like face with bright orange eyes covered by short blue fur. The usual abduction experience was frightening, but seeing this new creature made me feel like my heart would beat out of my chest. The being leaned over the instrument table, the greys kept their tools on, and began touching the objects there. Suddenly, I could move again. The creature came over to me and gently helped me into a sitting position on the table. Then, in plain English, asked if I was all right. I told her, and I say her because the voice of the being sounded most definitely female to me. Yes, and asked what was happening. I rose from the table and she led me from the exam room. Outside the room, in the large halls of the ship, there were dead bodies of greys around every corner. Creatures like her and several other new strange creatures were at control panels and moving about the ship. The creature introduced herself at this point as Boudica and told me that this ship was going to be destroyed. I asked her why and what was going on. She then explained to me something I never thought of in all the time I was being abducted. The Greys, in reality, were a cybernetic life form created by Boudica's race and more than three dozen other races in contact with each other on the other side of the Milky Way. Centuries ago, they formed a union with each other to establish trade, travel, and the discovery of new life forms across the universe. However, space travel was a long, difficult affair. So these large, strong alien races created the small, weak-looking greys as sort of advanced scouts, used to seek out, examine, and greet new intelligent life forms as they found it. The gray body design was chosen because the alien union thought that body shape was the least threatening. They, in general, being tall and muscular, they couldn't see the gray body type being a threat to anyone. As I proceeded through the ship, I noticed gray bodies being carried through the hall, some in pieces. And sure enough, in the open wounds of the grays, there were servos, wires, and components I could not identify in my limited experience. Boudica took me to a room filled with several other large aliens. One alien, an eight-foot-tall being who appeared to have a reptilian face with a feathery red crest around its head, asked how long the greys had been talking to me. I told him the last 15 years, and he apologized to me for all the pain and trouble I've been through. Then he promised me, I'd never have to go through any of that again. Boudica told me I'd have to be put to sleep to be transported back to my apartment because they didn't fully understand the methods the greys used to teleport people from place to place. She took a long rod-like instrument from the control panel and waved it once in front of my face. That is the last I remember from the grey ship. It has been more than six years since I've been abducted. 
I've tried to make sense of the events on the Greys' ship that night. As far as I can figure, the Greys were supposed to be a scouting party to survey newly discovered intelligent races in secret. For whatever reason, they failed their mission and would not stop abducting people and experimenting on them. So, the alien union who created them is now in the process of finding and destroying them. It is my belief that when the alien union finally destroys the threat to Earth posed by the Greys, then they might finally make their existence known to humanity and induct us into their collection of races across the universe. Thank you for joining us once again this week on Strange Pathways. If you or a loved one are having mental health trouble dealing with a paranormal incident, please reach out to the Opus Network, www.opusnetwork.org. Our Twitter is Pathways Strange. Our TikTok and Instagram, Strange Pathways Podcast. Join us over on our Facebook. We're going to have a few images from this week's episode up there for you to enjoy. And if you'd like to email us, you can do so at strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. Please, if you have an experience, if you'd like to tell me a story, if you'd just like to say hi, but especially if you have ever been involved with the Sisters Minor of Mary Immaculate, please reach out to me. That email once again. Strange Pathways Mail at gmail.com. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe on our YouTube channel. Leave a review on wherever you can on iTunes. I don't know if Spotify allows reviews. Rate us, rank us, do what you can to help us out. It is appreciated. Thank you once again for joining us here on Strange Pathways. Take care of yourselves and each other. Yeah.